Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Health Promotion Director, Roger Nelson. Thank you. Welcome to Sleep is My Superpower. I have a flair for the dramatic. Excuse me. Amazing discovery. Scientists have discovered a new treatment that will help you live longer. On top of that, it enhances your memory, creativity, your work, and your athletic performance. On top of that, it will help keep you slim and reduce your food cravings. On top of that, it will make you more attractive, more pleasant, more outgoing, and more productive. And on top of that, it will reduce your risk of car crashes, accidents and injuries, cold flu, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, cancer, and even dementia. And one last thing, it will definitely leave you feeling less depressed, less anxious, and more confident and happier. Interested? Of course, you know, we're talking about sleep. Perhaps the most misunderstood and underappreciated aspect of our well-being. I hope to fix that today by sharing with you information that has been gathered in over 18,000 well-scrutinized research studies and by sleep scientists around the world, like Matt Walker, who I am going to be providing some of his information from his TED Talk, which he entitled Sleep is Your Superpower. I'm going to be sharing some of his information today. I'd like to start with the hard-hitting facts of our sleep duration needs. They decrease as we get older, and most all of us, almost every single one of us, need eight hours nightly. There's a very, very small percentage that can actually thrive on a little less, about seven. There's a very, very small percentage that actually needs about nine rather than eight. And there's a less than 1% group of our population because of a mutation in our sleep gene, DCE2, they are blessed with the fact that they can actually thrive on six. And unfortunately, there's others with the mutation, they need up to 10. But most all of us need eight. Matt Walker states that sleep is not a lifestyle luxury. Sleep is a biological necessity. And we need to make point that there are serious consequences to sleep deprivation. Here's some concerning numbers. In our active duty population right now, at the time of this taping, for Offutt Airmen, we have 2,976 that are reporting getting less than seven. 372 alarmingly getting less than five. And 478 brave enough to admit that they know it's absolutely affecting their work performance which I think it's actually probably affecting a lot more than that. And in the civilian population, two-thirds are getting less sleep than what they need. So let's look at some of the eye-opening consequences of sleep deprivation. As Matt Walker states, I'd like to start with testicles. Men, some embarrassing information. Men who routinely sleep five hours a night compared to those who routinely sleep seven or more have significantly smaller testicles. And the seriousness to that is that it lowers their testosterone level to the equivalent of someone 10 years their senior. That is that it will age you a decade in regards to this critical aspect of your well-being. And we see similar impairments in female reproductive systems. Let's talk about sleep and your learning and memory. What we've learned, what's been discovered, is that we need sleep before learning and after learning. Before learning, we know that the brain when, when sleep is obtained, it's like 
it, it's like a sponge ready to soak up new information. And with sleep deprivation, the memory circuits of our brain become waterlogged and they're not able to soak up new information. We've also discovered that we need sleep after learning to transfer things to a permanent inbox for storage, if you will. Okay. And a study was done to test the hypothesis that pulling the all-nighter is a good idea. Let's take a look at this. So we took a group of participants, or they did, sleep scientists. One group got a full eight hours of sleep. The other group were sleep deprived throughout the entire night, not given any time for naps or caffeine, so it was miserable for them. They stayed awake the entire night. Then they placed them in an MRI scanner, and they were given a whole list of new facts to try to learn while snapshots were being taken through the MRI scanner. And when we compare those two side to side, here's what we see. In the sleep-deprived group, there's a 40% reduction in learning because of the sleep deprivation. That's the difference in the educational world of acing an exam versus failing it miserably. And further study has gone on to identify what goes on inside the brain, what goes on wrong inside the brain that, that explains that learning disability. On both sides of your brain sit a structure called your hippocampus. The hippocampus is like your, memoration, your memory inbox, if you will. It's very good at holding on to new information and storing it. And in groups where they were given eight hours of full sleep, we see very healthy brain learning activity taking place in the hippocampus. But in the sleep-deprived group, no sleep throughout the night, no significant signal could be found whatsoever. It's as though new information was just being bounced or immediately filed into the trash can and not held on. So the memories are forgotten. Let's talk next about sleep and your immune system, your immune health. These purple elements I'd like to introduce here are called natural killer cells. These natural killer cells, you can think of them as being the secret service agents of your immune system. They're very good at identifying and finding unwanted elements and destroying them. In this picture, it's natural killer cells that are attacking a tumorous growth, a cancerous growth. Okay? Now, in the study of natural killer cells, here's what's been found. When we sleep deprive a person, we just rob them of four hours. Rather than give them eight hours of sleep for just one night, we give them four hours of sleep for just one night. And then we look at the activity in their immune cell reduction in just one night after just four hours of shortened sleep. It isn't small, it isn't 10 or 20%. In just four hours reduced sleep for one night, it's a whopping 70% reduction in natural killer cell production. That's alarming. We've unfortunately and tragically learned through this pandemic how important our immune system is. Now, if the information that I've shared thus far is not sufficiently disquieting, Research has also gone on to show that lack of sleep will actually erode your very fabric of life itself, your DNA genetic code. In this study, participants were looked upon after they got a full eight hours of sleep, and they looked at their, nat their, their gene modification and gene activity with the full eight hours of sleep, and then they took the same group and had them uh, subtract two hours from that sleep nightly. So the participants got six hours of sleep nightly for one week. And here's what was found. Two significant 
findings. Number one, in regards to the DNA genes, a whopping 711 genes were distorted because of the lack of sleep of just two hours for one week. Now, of those 711, the second significant finding is that half of them actually increased in productivity, half of them actually decreased in productivity. The ones that decreased are the ones that are important for us to keep up because they strengthen our immune system. Those went down. The other ones which we want to keep low that were actually upgraded, unfortunately, are the ones associated with tumor promotion, inflammation, and cardiovascular disease. Sleep is like having a hole in your roof. Lack of sleep is like having a hole in your roof at home. If it's raining, and if sleep were the rain, it will leak down into every nook and cranny of your physiology and cause severe damage. Now I'd like to point out two more things that haven't been addressed so far. Socially, we know that sleep deprivation will weaken our personal engagement and enjoyment with others. And globally, all of us put together, it's, it's an astronomical cost on society because of increased automobile, hope and home and work-related accidents and deaths. And emotionally, we know that physically you'll start out tired, but it's so much worse than that, we realize. Emotionally, you might start out confused, or excuse me, mentally you might start out confused, but it's so much worse than that. But look at what happens emotionally, especially the more and more you happen to not be getting the sleep that you need. We know emotionally it increases your sadness. You will become grumpy much easier. Your patience will definitely be shortened. People become frustrated because of it. Some people become irritable. Some people become flat out mad and it gets worse. You can become angry and hostile. That unfortunately is an awful lot of emotional baggage that's unnecessary. And the longer sleep deprivation goes on, the heavier and heavier that the baggage gets. Now, if you are able to happenly, if you happen to unload all this emotional baggage through improved sleep hygiene, I can only guarantee you this. Tons and tons of increased happiness on a day in and day out basis. So let's go on to some good stuff. Let's look at strategies for better sleep. To do that, I'm going to unravel for you some of the science of sleep and unveil the strategies as we go. I want to start with the fact that there's something called our circadian rhythm. It's a force of nature. You need to understand it's a force of nature. Because of the Earth's alignment in the solar system and that we rotate around the sun, every 24 hours the sun comes up, the sun goes down. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. We operate in that 24-hour cycle. Now, the thing we know, need to know about that 24-hour cycle is What's best for us for the circadian rhythm is 16 hours of wakefulness and for most all of us, eight hours of sleep, 24 hours. Please be aware that you cannot change your circadian rhythm. If you, for example, tried to stay up for 24 hours and sleep for 12, and you tried to repeatedly do that, you will unfortunately be very unsuccessful. And the longer you try to adhere to that, the more consequences there will be. So it's a force of nature. Now, when I say force of nature, some people might think that that means it's totally out of our control. But please be aware that there's something deep inside your brain, I love this word, called your suprachiasmatic <coughs> nucleus. It acts like the light switch deep inside your brain. There's things that you can do to strengthen your circadian rhythm that strengthens this suprachiasmatic nucleus that allows the switch to be turned off to allow you to go to sleep. You will not fall asleep unless the suprachiasmatic nucleus is switched off. Then sleep will follow. 
It turns itself on and it promotes the ability for you to arise and awaken. Now, there are three things that you need to be aware of that you have direct control in that can strengthen your circadian rhythm and the power of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Please be aware that there's something known as sleep pressure. That is that when you wake up in the morning, if you subject yourself to natural sunlight being the most powerful, natural sunlight is a very powerful producer of wakefulness. If you want to wake yourself up suddenly, sooner rather than later, it starts with very first thing in the morning, opening the shades, opening the blinds, letting the natural sunlight come in. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you will within just one, two, three minutes start to notice that you are significantly more awake than if you left the shades pulled, left the lights off, and were walking around your dark house. It promotes wakefulness. And when it promotes wakefulness, it increases. The more wakefulness we produce throughout the day, the more sleep pressure it builds which is a good thing. When you produce a lot of wakefulness during the day, you'll produce more sleep pressure that, allow, that will allow you to feel groggy and fall asleep later that night. So the first strategy is please be aware that you should be concerned with the amount of sunlight that you are getting. People have heard of something called the seasonal deficit disorder. It's real. And there's certain areas of the world where that's profound, Alaska and other places where it's dark a long period of time. Even here in Omaha, Nebraska, it can affect people. And it's the fact that some people do not get themselves subjected to natural light. They leave their blinds closed. They work from home with their blinds closed and or when they go to work, they go to a dark environment with no windows and they keep Artificial light also promotes wakefulness. Not as powerful as natural light, but it promotes wakefulness as well. So that's the first strategy is understand that throughout the day, from the moment you wake up, close to when it's getting close to bedtime, you'll produce more sleep pressure if it's light, 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 light that's emitting your eyes. It doesn't mean standing out in the sun and getting sunburnt, but just having an eye shot of those rays coming in is effective. Okay. Now, the other thing we need to know about light is it's good throughout the day for promoting wakefulness, but to help you sleep, as in the natural world, the sun goes down, we need to sub subject ourselves to darkness to help promote grogginess. So as it gets closer and closer to the time that you're going to want to put your head on the pillow and fall asleep, in your home environment, you should be lightening and dimming the lights, if you will, all along the way. And it will help promote the sleep. And especially during night, your bedroom should be so dark that the boogeyman cannot find you. He should be stumbling into things. That's how dark it should be. Because any light that's entering the room will permeate your eyelids. You know that when you close your eyelids, you can still tell if the lights are on, right? And that's a signal that goes through the retina of your eye to your central nervous system that says, maybe it's not time to fall asleep. So the more darkness you can produce, the closer it gets to bedtime. And throughout the night, it improves the quality of your sleep. If you are falling asleep, getting seven or eight hours, but there is light emittance from your alarm clock, you want to turn that away and other things, it lessens the deepness of the sleep that you're getting. So that's first and foremost. That's a good strategy right there. Okay, let's go on to physical activity. The more physical activity you get throughout the day, in any shape or form, taking a walk, doing chores inside or outside your home, parking your car further away, taking the stairs rather than the elevator, actually truly getting cardiovascular exercise, actually truly getting strength training exercise. The more physical activity you get, throughout each and every single day, the more, especially activity, the more wakefulness it produces and the more sleep pressure it builds. So 
one of the very first things sleep scientists will go to if they're trying to help a person with their sleep, is they'll address those two things. Tell us about your exposure to sunlight and tell us about your physical activity level. In any way, shape, or form, those two things are huge. What physical activity does to a greater degree than light is with physical activity, your body's doing things, there's a waste product that's produced from the production of energy to do what you're doing. The waste product is called adenosine. Adenosine, the waste product of energy production to do what I'm doing right now, it builds up in your body. And the more physical activity you get, what explains the sleep pressure being built is the building up of the adenosine in your body that helps promote grogginess. Just like melatonin does, when we go back to that circadian rhythm, please be aware that what's natural is that at about 9 o'clock each night, a hormone starts to be released in your body, whether you want it to or not. It's a force of nature that melatonin starts to be produced and released in your body that will help promote grogginess. Adenosine is the same thing. It is a powerful agent that, if built up, will help you fall asleep faster when you put your head on the pillow and stay asleep. Okay? Now, what we want to know with physical activity is because it promotes wakefulness, it's better to perhaps get it done earlier in the day. It's perhaps best to avoid strenuous exercise within three hours prior to sleep because it revs you up. You go do a strenuous bout of exercise and get done exercise and then lay down and try to sleep, it isn't going to go very well. So we want to be aware of that. Now, all physical activity is good. If you're doing any physical activity close to bedtime, perhaps Hopefully, it's just like a leisurely walk or something like that, okay? Now, temperature. Just like natural outdoor world, temperature usually rises during the day, and so it is with our body temperature. It normally rises during the day, aligned with nature. What happens at night? The temperature goes down, and that's what needs to happen to our body temperature as well. It needs to decrease. Your body actually needs to decrease its internal core temperature by about two to three degrees Fahrenheit in order for you to promote sleep, to fall asleep. We know that it's much easier to fall asleep in a cold environment than it is a hot environment. And your body attempts to do that naturally. It, it attempts to reduce your body temperature as you get close to bedtime. Now, we can assist that, right? We can do things to help get more light. We can do things to get more activity. And you can do things with the temperature. You should aim for a bedroom temperature of around 65 degrees. Try 68. If it goes well, try 67. Somewhere in there, 65 to 67 is very beneficial in helping promote sleep, helping you fall asleep faster when your head hits the pillow, stay asleep longer, get better quality sleep. And there's things that you can do for that, right? Maybe it's an air conditioner. Maybe it's a, it's a fan. Maybe we get into... Your, your bed and your mattress, and are you using a, a mattress and sheets and so forth that help keep you cool? Your pillow, is it helping keeping you cool? Is the, the pillow case helping you stay cool? There's a lot of very new products out there that mattress-wise, bedsheet-wise, pillow case-wise, pillow cases that help us do that. When you sleep or anytime, your body primarily releases heat through your extremities, your head being the primary one, okay? You ever woken up and realized that you flip the pillow over because you want to feel the cool side of the pillow? That's because your head is too hot. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. So I hope that you can see that there are things that you can do to improve your sleep. Now, I've mentioned an awful lot about what's going on in your body as you're lying there sleeping. It's not that your body's doing nothing. We've learned that your body's actually doing quite a lot, but I haven't addressed these three or these four. Adenosine, which I told you was good to build up with physical activity. Build it up. It's good. But please be aware that it's sleep that is necessary to break it down. It builds up in the body, helps you fall asleep, but if you don't get the sleep that you need, it stays in your body, especially in your brain, and it builds up. When you get a poor night of sleep and you wake up 
and you're groggy and you're really tired? Well, it's more than you're just tired. You actually have a chemical imbalance in your body. You have a high level of adenosine built up that wasn't able to be broken down because of the lack of sleep. So it's huge. Okay. Hunger hormones, ghrelin and leptin, they're regulated to decrease your appetite and increase your energy expenditure. Okay. I think you all have realized that even after just one night of poor sleep, you're much more likely the next day not to follow through on your intended exercise, and you usually eat more poorly than what you anticipated. And that's not because of a lack of willpower. It's a chemical balance in the body that, that's the issue. Also, please be aware that blood sugar levels are regulated during sleep. We know that individuals who get poor sleep are at much greater risk, along with other factors, of developing diabetes and or the severity of the diabetes should it occur because of lack of sleep. This, in my opinion, Roger Nelson opinion here, the discovery and research into HGH, human growth hormone, is probably, in my opinion, the closest we've come to understanding the fountain of youth or discovering the fountain of youth, immortality, if you will. HGH, human growth hormone, is something we all have, young and old alike, male as well as female, and we need it, and we want a high amount of it. Because HGH, that hormone, is the primary ingredient that's been identified in restoring or re in, in, in cellular regeneration. Please realize you have over 37 trillion cells in your body. Of those 37 trillion cells, they all have a shelf life. That is that they live and die. Some cells only last 24 hours. Men, sperm cells only last 24 hours. Live and die, live and die, live and die. And through cellular mitosis, where an old cell will split and give birth to a new cell, that's what's happening in our body 24-7. We are in a constant state of cellular regeneration. It's interesting thought that the cells that take the longest, that have the longest lifespan, are about three months. So about every 90 to 100 days, you're actually living with a 37 trillion new cells than compared to three months earlier. And what explains, when you get down into the science of it, what explains the marked improvement? If a person truly improves their health and fitness in three months' time, four months' time, their blood pressure is much better now, their cholesterol level is much better now, their A1C is much better now, their body composition is much, much better now. They're healthier, they're stronger, they're leaner, they're fitter. What explains that is that they're living with 37 trillion cells that were better than the ones that preceded them. And HGH is produced and released at night. Now, when we look at sleep, I want you to understand that there's non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Non-REM sleep has four stages. Stage one is when you first initially fall asleep, five, 10 minutes, and you can be very easily awakened. And then as you get into stage two, that's where the body starts to do more things to actually truly soundly get to sleep. Your heart rate slows and your body temperature drops. And then some wonderful things start happening as you get into stage three and four, which is called deep sleep. When you're in deep sleep, it will be harder to wake you up. And there are very magical, very many magical things that are happening during sleep, deep sleep. During deep sleep, your brainwave activity is slow, and you got these really powerful brainwaves going on. At the top of the brainwave is these bursts of what's called spindles. And there's a lot of science that has gone into the value of creating these big, long waves and things that you can do to enhance that and increase the power of those spindles at the top. That's by making certain that when you do get deep sleep, it's truly good, deep quality sleep. And then, after you go through stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, you enter then what's called REM sleep, where 
if you were sleeping and in REM sleep, if I came close and looked at you underneath your eyelids, I could see that your eyes are darting all over the place. Your brainwave activity, instead of being slow and big like this, it's on fire, very similar to as when you're awake. Very similar. And there's magical things that are happening during REM sleep. Please be aware, unless you're a very rare, very small population of people that have a sleeping disorder or disturbance, what happens during REM sleep is your body actually becomes paralyzed. And that's a good thing. You can dream throughout every single stage. But in REM sleep, that's where your dreams are most vivid. They come to life. And thank goodness your body is paralyzed so you don't act out your dreams. So with those sleep stages, please be aware that they progress throughout the night. When you first start with your stage one and two, it progresses into stage three and four. And then your very first period of REM sleep is very short, only five or 10 minutes when you're about an hour and a half into that. But what happens is they battle each other throughout the night. And the amount of time spent in the non-REM sleep shortens as you progress into the night. And the amount of time that you spend in REM sleep increases each cycle. Now what's very important, and I want to make certain I hit home about this, is unfortunately, being none the wiser, many people conclude that a minor sleep disruption such as waking up to turn the pillow over because your head is hot. Waking up to go to the bathroom. And you go to the bathroom and two or three minutes later, you're back falling asleep. Many people might think, well, that was only a two, three, four minute interruption. No big deal. I want you to understand that fragmented sleep is far less in quality than sound sleep. If you were to get eight hours of sound sleep and you were to get four hours, then an interruption, then four hours again, you get eight hours just like he does, but yours was fragmented. And the more fragmented it is, the worse it is. That quality of sleep where it's non-disturbed is much greater in quality and benefit than the fragmented sleep. That's because when you experience a sleep disruption, the dog barking, things like that, Let's say it happens right here, just before you're ready to get into your necessary and beneficial fifth cycle of REM. When you go back to sleep, you don't pick up where you left off. Remember stage one and stage two? That's where you go back to. And it takes a period of time to go through stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four before you get back to where you were. And if that disruption occurred right there and it didn't allow you to get back to that, it's about 40 to 50% of your necessary REM sleep that your body needs that you're depriving yourself of. Your thought that it was only a two or three minute disruption equals 40 to 50% reduction in the necessary REM sleep you need each night. Now think of if those disruptions are happening more than once, how profound that is. It happens one or two times. It takes away from the deep sleep that you need, and it can be robbing you of the REM sleep that you need as well. So make no mistake about it. We want to hopefully consider anything and everything that we can do within our power to promote sleep, bring it on, get good sleep during the night, and most especially, avoid any dis uh, sleep disruption during the night. Now. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about sleep inertia. A couple things I want you to understand about sleep inertia. That's the science of sleep also. Is, you know, it's that feeling of disorientation or grogginess you feel upon first waking up in the morning, right? Please be aware, first and foremost, that's natural. Even if you get eight, nine hours of great sleep, you will, to some degree, still have some sleep inertia in the morning. It will pass. It typically lasts 15, maybe 30 minutes. Is there a biological necessity that you absolutely must have caffeine first thing in the morning? 
No, that feeling will pass. But unfortunately, what happens, of course, and it's, it's a socially widely acceptable thing, is many of us reach for coffee or caffeine first thing in the morning, and that's not such a bad thing. But I want you to know the facts about sleep inertia. The reason why I bring it up is because it's important to understand that it produces grogginess, which lessens your mental faculties and all that stuff. And if you wake up with extreme sleep inertia, which can happen if this occurs, if you are suddenly awakened during deep REM sleep, you will wake up with a heck of a lot of sleep inertia. I remember the first time it ever happened to me. I was in college, took a nap on the couch, roommate come and woke me up suddenly, abruptly, and I kind of looked at the clock, and I'd been asleep for about an hour, 45 minutes. And I was thinking, oh my goodness. You know, my first thought was, that was a much longer nap than I anticipated. Uh, God, I must have been really tired. This is going to be good. And upon even trying to get up off the couch, I seriously thought that one of my roommates drugged me. I was asking them, because I was, I was all out of sorts. My legs were heavy. I was, I was wobbly. I had no physical ability, no mental clarity, disorientation, confused, haze. I was like a zombie. And I literally thought, all right, which one of you, which one of you drugged me? This isn't funny, guys. Who drugged me? It was that I was awakened suddenly from sleep inertia. And that can last up to four hours. I would hate for any of you to wake up, whether it's in the morning or from a nap, with a heck of a lot of sleep inertia and say, oh my goodness, i got to get my kids to the t-ball practice. Let's go, kids. And you're out in the car. Your lives are at stake. Because when there's a lot of sleep inertia, you're going to want to go back to sleep. So it's of seriousness that we address this. And I want you to understand that there's things that we can do to minimize it. One of the things that we can do to minimize sleep inertia, please be aware that what, what good sleep hygiene looks like. Good sleep hygiene looks like this. It's that you go to bed with the decision at, to go to bed at a time that at least allows you the opportunity to get the eight hours. We know there's a biological necessity for. So if you know that you need to be up by six, Hopefully, you're down and out by 10. There's a personal decision to do that. That's part of good sleep hygiene, starting with giving yourself the allowance of time that you need. Second, good sleep hygiene is that we know it strengthens the circadian rhythm dramatically if you can go to bed and wake up at approximately the same time every single day. We like regularity. Go to bed at 10, wake up at 6. Go to bed at 10, wake up at 6. Even on the weekends, go to bed at 10, wake up at 6. That regularity is profound in strengthening your circadian rhythm, improving the quality of your sleep. And what good sleep hygiene also looks like is be aware of this. You don't have to force yourself to wake up, right? Some of us are very dependent upon the alarm clock waking us up when we need to be awake in order to go do what we need to do. That means that if the majority of the time your alarm clock is waking you up, guess what you're not giving yourself? The amount of sleep that you need because you will naturally wake up after you've been given about those eight hours of sleep that you need. Now, good sleep hygiene is that you can go to bed at night at about the same time, wake up naturally. When you get through that fifth cycle of REM, you start back at stage one or two, where you're easily awakened. And it's usually after you get through that fifth cycle that you will automatically just naturally wake up without the need of an alarm clock. The only time I ever set my alarm is when my wife and I are gonna travel and we're getting an Omaha flight out of Omaha at like three or four in the morning. Otherwise, the majority of the time, 10, 15, Roger's asleep. 6, 15, give or take, I'm waking up, naturally. And there's power in that. Because of the length of time that you spend in that fifth cycle of REM sleep that you don't want to wake up from because it produces a lot of sleep inertia, because of its length of time around that seventh, eighth hour, if you are waking up with the alarm clock, 
there's about a 40 to 50% chance that you're being awakened during deep REM sleep, and that's why you have a lot of sleep inertia in the morning. There's something called sleep stage alarm clocks. Are you familiar with them? They don't ring loudly to wake you up. They will start emitting a light. Then it will get brighter and brighter as minutes pass. It will start emitting a sound that will get louder and louder as time passes. If any of you right now are dependent upon alarm clocks waking you up, and you know that you're feeling those sleep inertia, please take things within your control. Please seriously consider a sleep stage alarm clock. Please consider getting the amount of sleep that you need, and time will present to yourself uh, that you're getting the sleep you need, waking up naturally without that alarm clock. So that's some information about sleep inertia. We don't necessarily have to reach for caffeine to shrug it off. It's natural, it's going to occur, but we want to prevent it occurring extremely, and we certainly want to make certain we're careful of our actions if experiencing a lot of it. Now let's talk very quickly about fatigue management. To nap or not to nap? Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do, right? But here's what we know about napping. It can be beneficial if controlled. Now, good sleep hygiene is such that you never ever really feel the necessity that you need to nap. First and foremost, if you have good sleep hygiene, you'll probably never really ever feel the need to. But if things are array and things are going on, Please be aware that a, a, a typical normal day for somebody, a, a day shift worker and so forth, is that with that circadian rhythm, there's a natural lull in your energy level from about one to three. If you did strategically want to take a short nap, it would be actually much easier to do that, to actually fall asleep, to take a nap between one or three. It's going to be more difficult earlier in the morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, try to take a nap, you'd lay down, it's like, I can't take a nap. Five o'clock in the afternoon might be even more difficult. It's usually about one to three. There's a natural dull in our uh, alertness, if you will. If you do take a nap, please be aware that research has positively shown that naps as little as 10 to 20 minutes that have become known as power naps are actually proven to re-energize you, improve your physical performance, improve your mental acuity, and focus and concentration. Please be aware that naps greater than 20 minutes will take you into deep sleep and REM sleep following that. And we don't want to wake up from a nap in those stages. So it's usually best to either do 10 to 20 minute naps and or if out of necessity, you're really sleep deprived and you need a lot of sleep. It's either 10 or 20 minute nap or give yourself a full hour and 40 minutes so you can make certain that you get through that REM sleep and then maybe wake up when your alarm goes off an hour and 40 minutes later without a lot of extreme sleep inertia. And be aware that the later and longer a nap is taken in the day, it's going to, pro it's going to affect your ability to go to sleep that night. Now, to caffeinate or not to caffeinate? Here's some pros and cons to that. Pros is that it increases adrenaline. That's not such a bad thing. That's a good thing. It promotes wakefulness. Okay, it'll do that. It lasts a long time. Any amount of caffeine you consumed, it has a half-life of about five hours. That is that if you took a strong cup of coffee, 200 milligrams at 12 noon, at five o'clock, half of it is still in your system. It's still serving its purpose five hours later. One to 200 milligrams, that dosage has actually been proven to improve mental and physical performance. And... We know that the other pro of regular small dosages of caffeine day in and day out, day in and day out, has actually been associated with protecting against chronic disease. That is, if the dosages are kept small and in check where they're not going over 400 milligrams daily. There's positive things associated with that. So it's widely socially acceptable. I don't, I'm not going to slap anybody on the wrist for drinking an energy drink or coffee or taking a caffeine pill, but I am going to be very concerned if we know it's exceeding this. Here's the cons. Caffeine blocks adenosine. We want adenosine to be built up during the day. Anytime, even 6 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, 
2 o'clock in the afternoon, any of those intakes of caffeine is lowering the amount of adenosine that helps you feel groggy later that night. It's suppressing it. There are some people that are very sensitive to caffeine. I usually, just for everybody involved, encourage people not to consume caffeine past 12 noon because it can still be in your system eight, nine hours later. And I strongly advocate that people take very seriously the total amount of caffeine that they consume throughout the day, and we'll get into that. Please be aware that dosages larger than 100 to 200, if you take dosages of 300 to 400, it actually has a flip effect on improving your mental and physical performance. It's not as good as 1 to 200. It increases nervousness, anxiety, and aggression, jitteriness. You become short-tempered. You can become irritable, things like that. You can become impatient. Please be aware, eight hours prior to bedtime, it can still be affecting your sleep. And this is a big one. Please be aware that as widely socially acceptable as caffeine is, large doses sustained over time can be hazardous to your health. It used to be 600 milligrams was the recommendation. A few years ago, it changed based upon new research that came in that has positively concluded that large dosages sustained over the course of time are positively linked to a lot of consequences. So I ask all of you when you leave here today to not only be thinking about what you can do to promote better sleep, but also be thinking about your relationship with caffeine. And realize this, that there's a lot of considerations you can make before reaching for caffeine. Be aware that dosages over 400 to 800 is only supposed to be occurring for the sake of sustained operations. If we need to keep you awake for wartime mission for 24, 36 hours, yes, I will be giving you caffeine. And we may need to, because of the necessity to keep you awake and save lives and carry out the mission, we may be getting you up to 800. But we're not in wartime mission right now, are we? On a day-to-day -day basis, we best seriously give consideration to keep it under 400. And remember that you can, again, minimize your reaching for caffeine with understanding this. Y'all, most of us take a nice shower in the morning, right? I've gotten the practice of this. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to try it. Go ahead and take your three, four, five minute nice warm hot shower. Enjoy it. It's relaxing and so forth. But be aware when you keep it really hot and you, and, and you get out of a hot shower, it, it, it kind of wants to keep you in a, a lull of relaxation and maybe go back to bed. Do this for me. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you take a shower, finish your shower by turning it cool. 10, 15, 15. 20 seconds, see how much you can tolerate. And that 10, 15, 20 seconds of cool water, that you gutting it out and do it for 20 or 30 seconds and making it even colder, that will activate your, your, your nervous system and you will instantaneously go like, wow, I am suddenly awake. And it might play a part in helping you not reach for that second cup of coffee 20 minutes later after you've gotten the first one down. Light exposure keeps you awake. Upbeat music, right? That'll keep you awake. Standing. It's difficult to fall asleep when you're standing. Shift workers and so forth need to make certain that they do not do a lot of sitting down on the job or laying down. They need to keep themselves moving. It promotes wakefulness. Physical activity, any way, shape, or form. This is a huge one. Please understand that there's great value in drinking and eating something rather than nothing every three hours of the day, especially if you're a shift worker. You want to absolutely make certain that you are drinking and eating something rather than nothing every three hours. The number one and number two trigger for daytime fatigue or shift work fatigue is dehydration and low blood sugar. Seven out of 10 Americans are chronically dehydrated. That's because seven out of 10 Americans are not aware of the fact that the amount of hydration you need is about half your body weight in fluid ounces daily. 
So if you weigh 200 pounds, you should day in and day out be drinking about 100 fluid ounces. That is what will keep you hydrated. When you keep yourself hydrated, it promotes wakefulness. It also promotes wakefulness with the fact that whenever you get any slight feeling like you have an urge to go pee, it's difficult to fall asleep. And if you are one of the 7 out of 10 chronically dehydrated people and you start to drink more, yes, you will go to the bathroom more often. A few weeks after getting, your body will acclimate it, itself to that. But it serves its purpose in promoting wakefulness. Okay? And energy for all the other activity. And then be aware that if it's been four hours, five hours, six, seven hours since you last ate anything, your blood sugar levels might be running low, which physically and mentally makes us like a zombie. And you'll be much, much more inclined to fall asleep doing shift work if you're not keeping yourself hydrated and nourished throughout that. And if we're not shift workers, the same thing throughout the entirety of the day. Keep yourself hydrated and nourished because it avoids those two primary triggers. Many times, people at 4 o'clock in the afternoon oh, will give themselves one of these and they'll think, oh, God, I'm tired. I need, I need caffeine. No, you're dehydrated. Just get some water to take care of that. Okay? Caffeine consumption, this is a big one, is largely associated with habit rather than necessity. I ask that you all please examine your habits. Is there a need to have that second cup of coffee in the morning? Is there a need to have that second or third cup or Red Bull or caffeine pill later in the day? Or is it just simply because it's unfortunately become part of our norm, a part of our habit? Let's try to fix that. A large part in fixing that may be that you might want to consider going to decaffeinated coffee can't tell the difference. Now, to pill or not to pill. I cannot advocate for everybody wide use of sleeping medication to fix the problem because pills and so forth are blunt instruments that do not create naturalistic sleep. They sometimes serve a purpose in short-term duration under certain circumstances that a doctor should be aware of of why they're being prescribed and they should just not be widely acceptable or being used as the fix to the problem because they are positively linked to increasing cancers. They're positively linked to increasing cardiovascular disease. They are positively linked that if you become a, a, a habitual user a sleep aid, pills, and so forth, you are placing yourself at four to five times greater risk of death. Our nation, just like the other epidemic with other pharmacological drugs, sleeping pills cause an awful lot of deaths across our great nation. So here's the nine big rocks. We've kind of already addressed most of them. Give yourself at least nine hours of sleep. Go to bed at the same time nightly within plus or minus 15 minutes. Maximize that light exposure during the day. Get it dark at night. Get physical activity every single day. Make certain your bedroom is cool. Take care of your bed. If you've got an uncomfortable bed and you're tossing and turning, that's major. You want to eliminate the tossing and turning. Even if you have to spend four or $500 on a new mattress, that is money well spent on the investment of your well-being. Maybe it's a $20 better pillow that you need so you don't continually wake up and flip it over to the cool side. Those things can be huge. Eliminate noise. I have two dogs, one big that we've learned that he doesn't disrupt us if we let him roam the house freely at night going in and outside of the house. I have a much smaller dog that in order to make certain that he doesn't, doesn't disrupt our sleep, we have to kennel him. If we leave him out, like the big dog, he will bark at the, the littlest sound of anything. And we tried it. We thought, well, let him just roam around like our big dog does. And we couldn't do it. He loves his kennel, and when he's in his kennel, he is quiet. So we do what's necessary with both dogs. The one loves being out and about, the other one loves the kennel, and we love it also. 
What other, what other thing could you do to eliminate noise? I've had many people say, gosh, I never thought about how disruptive that grandfather clock that chimes is. Turn off the chime. Move it down into the basement or something where you can't hear it. When you travel and you stay at holiday inns and so forth, maybe you might need to bring an eye mask with you because you can't control the holiday inn sign admitting all the light through the, the shades that aren't dark blackout shades. Shove the towel underneath the door where you can't hear all the people going in and out, shutting all the other doors in the hallways. Think of all the strategies you can place to maximize your sleep potential. And it goes on to avoiding things eight hours prior, three hours prior. Nicotine is a stimulant. You want to avoid that at least one hour prior. And then in your booklet, I didn't get into this, there's do's and don'ts of things that you want to consider doing and things that you want to consider not doing three hours prior to bedtime, two hours prior to bedtime, one hour prior to bedtime, and then what to consider not doing or doing within that last hour. That's in your booklet. Give it a read. You want to make it a habit that you have a 3 two, one routine, that you're consciously aware of it. It's time to start doing this. It's time to start doing this. And do that day in and day out. And it's a conditioning and associative uh, response that prepares your body for much better sleep. Those are the nine big rocks. There's much more that are in your Sleep is My Superpower booklet. Please read it in its entirety. Please be aware that there's, again, I mentioned it, much more information in there than what I covered here, especially for shift workers. Very important information in that booklet about shift work. Also in that booklet, at the end, there's the material that you need to participate in what we call the 14-day sleep, superpower sleep challenge. I want to put it upon all of you as a challenge to improve your sleep. No matter how good it is right now, could it get even a little bit better? For some of you, it could be that it needs to get majorly better. You can start this challenge whenever you want. I'd rather that you do it sooner rather than later. And it's very self-explanatory. It's about dedicating yourself to your relationship with sleep and for 14 days giving it your ultimate priority to take care of those one-time actions that will improve your sleep. Get your blackout blinds. Get them hung. Things like that. Get the kennel for your dog. Things like that. Move the grandfather clock. Things like that. And a 14-day concentration on execution of things you want to become a habit. Physical activity, light exposure, very self-explanatory. If you successfully complete it, we have ready for you through the Health Promotion Office a Sleep is My Superpower night shirt with a nice logo on it. Eye mask. Don't kick it if you haven't tried it. My room, I said, is at home is so dark the boogeyman can't find me, but when I travel and I'm not certain of how dark it's going to be in the Holiday Inn or whatever, I bring an eye mask with me. Don't knock it until you've tried it. Earplugs will also give you a set of those. Don't knock it until you try it. When I was a much younger man, I trusted my instincts when I was much younger, and I started educating myself up on the importance of sleep hygiene, and I realized I was a light sleeper. I just trusted my gut instinct that it's too easy for me to be wakened up. A couple years ago, I took a genetic test. I found out that I am a light sleeper. I have genes within me that make me a light sleeper. I cannot tell you how important those earplugs are for me. They're huge. They make a hell of a big difference. Put them in the ears. Not only does it quiet everything down, but it gets you in touch with your parasympathetic nervous system. When you put those earplugs in, you can hear yourself breathe. And when you look into the booklet, I give you two practices of what to do when you first put your head down on the pillow to do some deep breathing and relaxation exercise. And if you're doing earplugs, it helps tremendously that you can actually hear your breathing taking place. And when you can hear your breathing taking place, it helps increase your parasympathetic nervous system to help promote sleep. So give it a try, okay? So you'll get all those things, the eye mask, the shirt. You'll also get a pair of blue light blocking glasses that go a long way if you wear them into the evening times 
uh, working on any laptop devices or your cell phones and so forth, that blue light emittance is not, not good. And there's blocking glasses that we have available for you should you do this challenge. So we have those things waiting for you. Plus everything, anytime anyone completes any of our challenges, it's considered a, dis a distinguished accomplishment. And we want to make certain that uh, we give your leadership um, uh, awareness to the fact that you've completed the challenge for any possible unit recognition, recognition for what you've accomplished. Now with what I've shared with you, I hope that you realize that improving your sleep can add years to your life and life to your years. And with that, I wish you tonight and every night a good night's sleep. Thank you for your time.